everyone, I'm back again here with another in-depth view for the writing task one or the integrated task for the TOEFL IDT. I already made one video about this uh, and I have the link in the description box so you can go visit it. With all the years that I've worked uh, with students during IDT tests, I've actually located a few mistakes that generally they do. So I'm going to discuss some of those mistakes before I go into the uh, illustrated uh, version of this video. One of the first mistakes they do is that they are overconfident, too confident of their writing skills. They don't practice at all or they don't even search online what this whole writing uh, task is about and they just jump into it the day of the exam. They don't really understand what this uh, exercise is about. I already explained that on the past video. I'm not going to go into it. And when they develop their essay, even though they may explain at some point what you are supposed to explain, you don't do it in the proper way that TOEFL is expecting you to do it. Another mistake is that they don't improve any of the skills that they do need to. Another mistake that they do is that as soon as they read the task, they start typing away and you're not supposed to do that. First, you organize your essay and then you start typing. And organizing your essay should take you about, I don't know, probably five to eight minutes. Now, the exercise that I will use for this specific video comes from the official guide of the TOEFL IBT. Uh, if you have a past guide, like from 2013 or even prior to that, you will see that there are certain differences between the examples that they provide and the actual test. Uh, I did the test recently this year and I've seen that there's a large improvement on how they present the reading article. Uh, what happens is that you will always get a four paragraphs article. The first paragraph will always be the introductory paragraph and from there you will get three uh, very noticeable subtitles. They will come in bold type, uh, in, a, in a bold font and uh, each one of those subtitles are already telling you what are the three essential points that you should find in your reading article. Now this is how the article should look on your screen. Now I only cut the article part. I have a link for that image in the description box below so you can uh, see it and use it in case you want to uh, work it on your own. So I am going to give you the three minutes you are going to get so you can uh, read this article.
So let's take a look at the first paragraph. The first paragraph explains us what endotherms are, and it's very simple. It's animals such as modern birds and mammals that can keep their own body temperature. So the so our introductory paragraph explains us the definition of endotherms and at the same time presents us a hypothesis that uh, dinosaurs are actually endotherms. So when they present the hypothesis, they have to sustain this hypothesis with facts or evidence. So these three essential points are actually those three pieces of evidence that they have in order to sustain the, that hypothesis. So the first paragraph explains the first piece of evidence and that's called polar dinosaurs. And what it explains is that they have discovered fossils in polar regions and endotherms are the only kind of animal who will be uh, capable to survive the temperatures in those polar regions. Now, what the second paragraph explained is the leg position and movement. And basically what it says is that the physiology of endotherms is pretty much that of, uh, of a dinosaur. And the legs of a dinosaur are located under the body. And this is an, an essential point because keeping the legs under the body will allow the animal to do certain activities such as running. And running is one activity that only endotherms would uh, do. The last paragraph explains what Haversian canals are. And Haversian canals are uh, canals inside of each bone that allows blood vessels such as veins and arteries to pass through the bone. And this characteristic is only of endotherms. And there's a specific part in this paragraph that says that uh, fossilized bones of dinosaurs are usually dense with Haversian, Haversian canals. So these three points are where are supposed to be on your notes. Obviously, I would prefer it if you could expand these points a little further, but you know, let's consider you only have three minutes to complete this task. Now let's listen to what the lecture has to say about this. Many scientists have problems with the arguments you read in the passage. They don't think those arguments prove that dinosaurs were endotherms. Take the polar dinosaur argument. When dinosaurs lived, even the polar regions where dinosaur fossils have been found were much warmer than today. Warm enough during part of the year for animals that were not endotherms to live. And during the months when the polar regions were cold, the so-called polar dinosaurs could have migrated to warmer areas or hibernated like many modern reptiles do. So the presence of dinosaur fossils in polar regions doesn't prove the dinosaurs were endotherms. Well, what about the fact that dinosaurs had their legs placed under their bodies, not out to the side like a crocodile's? That doesn't necessarily mean dinosaurs were high energy endotherms built for running. There's another explanation for having legs under the body. This body structure supports more weight. So with the legs under their bodies, dinosaurs could grow to a very large size. Being large had advantages for dinosaurs, so we don't need the idea of endothermy and running to explain why dinosaurs evolved to have their legs under their bodies. Okay, so how about bone structure? Many dinosaur bones do have haversian canals, that's true. But dinosaur bones also have growth rings. Growth rings are a thickening of the bone that indicates periods of time when the dinosaurs weren't rapidly growing. These growth rings are evidence that dinosaurs stopped growing or grew more slowly during cooler periods. This pattern of periodic growth, you know, rapid growth followed by no growth or slow growth, and then rapid growth again, is characteristic of animals that are not endotherms. Animals that maintain a constant body temperature year-round, as true endotherms do, grow rapidly even when the environment becomes cool. So, from the lecture, we could get these three essential points. Our first point refers again to the polar dinosaurs that were described also in the first place in the reading article. So, like I said in the past video, these two points will have opposite points of view. And they're going to cast doubt or are simply going to contradict what the first uh, source of information was about. So, the polar dinosaurs point. Uh, the professor explains that Back in the day of the dinosaurs, the polar regions were warmer than they are today. So, you know, 
pretty much any animal could survive, especially in the warm uh, months of the year and whenever it was cold they could have just emigrated to other areas or could have just hibernated like modern reptiles do today. Then the professor skip goes to the second point which is the leg position and movement and in a nutshell what she says is that the structure uh, of the bone's position is actually designed not for the animal to be able to run, but more to support the weight. Let's remember that dinosaurs were really huge animals and the weight could have not been supported if the legs were just at the sides of the body. And finally, they also explain what about those haversion canals and yes, like the professor said, they do have conversion, uh, haversion canals, but most of the times they're actually growth ranks because cold animals, cold-blooded uh, animals, have slow and quick growth, which happens in the periods of warm and cold temperatures in the environment. So these rings are not haversion canals and they could have been confused by this uh, growth rings. So after we already took the points from the reading article and we contrast those notes with the lecture notes, obviously those are completely opposite points of view. We first believe one hypothesis or a theory and then with other types of evidence we get that that might not be completely true. We can start contrasting the points and do all the steps that I explained in the past exercise. So your essay should look pretty much to the sample essay that I also provide uh, in the description box below. That's pretty much how your essay should look like. I have momentarily deactivated my Facebook. It's not a kind of tool that I am using right now. I know that many of you probably are still uh, looking at my Facebook page. I am no longer uh, posting anything in it. Depending on how I feel or if you are more interested in using Facebook rather than my other social networks, then you might want to leave a comment in, uh, in the comments below. But you can also visit my website, EnglishTestExercises.com, in case you want to practice some more in your TOEFL ITP. Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter, which are the actual two social networks that I do use at add TOEFL blow dashed courses. Remember to like, share and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. I know that you pretty much were wondering what a haversion canal is, so I'm providing a photo that is a haversion canal. You're not going to see the picture in the test, but I just wanted to know what actually they are.